Hi everyone, welcome back to Base Leg. So uh, we've had a couple of requests here, actually more than a couple lately. It seems like a bunch of airplanes are getting finished. And some of you are asking, hey, what should we do for first flight preps? So that's a good discussion. And I know I've written a couple of columns, uh, both for kit planes and sport aviation. And we'll put those dates in some of the subtitles here so you can go back and research those. Uh, but if you're like me, you'd rather somebody talk to you than read. So we're going to try and do some highlights here on some things that I'd recommend you do. And we're going to do three separate videos probably over the course of the next week because there's three key areas I think you need to pay attention to on first flights. The first one, obviously, is the airframe. The second one is the engine. And then the third one, and the really important one, is the pilot. So we're going to talk about each of those independently, okay? And I tell you what we're going to do, we're going to start with the engine. So uh, one of the things and you want to make certain of your engine is have somebody else look it over before you run it the first time. And before you run it the first time, I'd recommend that you pre-oil them. The engines, you know, unless you got it right from Lycoming and were able to install it the very next day, oil and stuff tends to run off. It's good to pre-oil it. So you're thinking, where do I get a pre-oiler? Well, I'm going to tell you a quick and easy way to do that. All you need to do is pull all the spark plugs out of your cylinders. Make sure you've got the oil reservoir filled, whether it's the sump on an engine, the remote sump, like on a Rotax engine, will work the same way. Again, pull all the spark plugs. And what you're going to do is power up all your avionics. Make sure nobody's around the front of the aircraft and you don't have any tow bars or anything hooked up. What you're going to do then is engage the starter. And you can do that for 20 to 30 seconds. You're not going to hurt your starter. I know you'll see the tags when you install your starter, it'll say 10 seconds or 20 seconds max, but that's with all the plugs in there and you're actually having that starter work against compression strokes. When you take all those spark plugs out, you could actually almost stand there and do it by hand for a couple of minutes and you'll get oil pressure. But what we want to do is run that starter again until you got maybe about the most you'll get is 30 to 40 PSI, but you will get oil pressure. And just let it run there for maybe a few seconds holding that oil pressure and you're done. And you can put all the spark plugs back in. And then, as I mentioned, have somebody else go over that engine compartment. Make sure everything's tight, all the fittings and everything, as you've probably heard me talk about in past conversations or columns. I like to see everybody use some kind of uh, torque sealant, some kind of reminder. You can use fingernail polish, anything out there. Crosscheck is the latest brand. It's nothing but, but uh, some lacquer paint that's real thick and put it across every fitting in the engine compartment. That way you know they're all tight, okay? So once we've got it pre-lubed, we're ready to run. Put fresh fuel in the tanks, okay? And then what you're gonna do, we're gonna pressurize that fuel system. So with your mixture all the way back, you're not gonna do that on a Rotax engine, but typically on Lycomings and Thunderbolts, you can pull the mixture all the way back and make sure your fuel is on the selected tank that you wanna use and go ahead and hit the boost pump. You should see a rise in fuel pressure if you've got a fuel pressure uh, system set up. If you've got a high wing airplane, you're probably not going to have a boost pump. So you're just going to turn the uh, fuel valve on and let gravity do its thing. And uh, we want to check for leaks, okay? Basically, you're going to be able to check for leaks all the way out pretty much to the fuel servo or the carburetor. So if you've got a carburetor, you're going to look at that gascalator and make certain there's no leaks there. You should see about four to seven. Most of the times you'll only see about five PSI on a carbureted system when you turn that pump on. If you've got an injected engine, you want to look for fuel pressure north of 20, maybe 23, 27 PSI with the electric fuel pump on. Some systems will be higher. You may have 40 PSI, but you've got a lot of pressure there. So you want, to, you want somebody helping you with this one. You want to, you know, when you turn that fuel pump on, have somebody be watching uh, your engine compartment for a while. On a carbureted engine, you're going to hear the pump run for a little bit while the bowl in the carburetor fills up, and then you should hear that fuel pump actually change its uh, noise level. You'll hear it going kind of fast, and then it should kind of just kind of slow down that, 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 that once the carburetor fills up, and that's when you'll see the pressure uh, go up as well. On, a, on an injected engine, unless you have a uh, gascalator in it, which isn't recommended, you don't need one unless you're from Canada. I think they're still making you do gascalators up there. 
uh, you're not going to have much fuel flow. You may see if you have a fuel flow meter in there, you'll probably see a little bit of uh, indication there. You might see three or four gallons per hour there until it, it stops once the system gets pressurized, okay? And, and what you want to do is watch your air box, the air filter area, and make certain things don't start leaking. If you have any leakage past your spider, if you have leakage into the carburetor bowl, maybe the float has stuck because it sat for a while or something, you're going to see fuel start to pour out of the air box there in the bottom of the engine. If, for, if you have a carburetor that's leaking like that, sometimes you can tap it with a rubber mallet, and that will help that float uh, kind of jiggle loose and stop the leaking there, okay? So again, we're going to check the fuel system, check the oil system. We should be good to go with that. For those of you that uh, have a magneto on there, uh, unless you've got two impulse coupled magnetos, please make certain on that direct drive one, you've put the proper jumper on the key switch. So the non-impulse magneto does not want to fire while you're cranking. You'll get a kickback potentially if you don't have that one grounded out and you can do some damage to the starter, starter case, and potentially the starter ring gear as well, okay? So we're all set to run. I recommend you have one or two people on either side of the aircraft with a halon or a CO2 fire extinguisher. No uh, typical kitty home fire extinguishers class, uh, uh, whatever they are, ABC. C, ABC fire extinguishers. Okay, that'll just damage. Have them watch and uh, make sure you got your throttle back. We don't wanna start up real quick here. Make sure the aircraft, uh, I recommend tying it down on first runs because the brakes typically haven't been set. For sure, use chocks, okay? Uh, make sure nobody's behind you. When you start it for the first time, your eye ought to immediately go to the oil pressure gauge, which we should have had oil pressure when you pre-oiled it, but you want to check it and make certain now with it running. And we don't want to make that first engine run more than 1,500 RPMs in the case of Lycomings. Rotax is maybe 1,800, keep it at idle, 1,800 to 2,000 RPMs. And we're only going to run it for maybe a couple of minutes. Basically, we're going to want to check for leaks. So after a couple of minutes, go ahead and uh, shut it off uh, using the mixture controller. If you've got electronic ignition, you may have to use your switches. Uh, Rotax, you just, uh, you know, again, use the switches. So, uh, and we want to stop right there and then go back and check for leaks. Because what we've done now is pressurize the oil system. So if you've got an oil cooler, remote oil filter, et cetera, we want to check all those hoses and make sure there's no leaks, make sure there's no leaks in the fuel system. And if everything looks good, we're all set to go. Okay, so what you're going to do now, depending on the kind of engine you have, if it's a Lycoming engine, a new engine, we certainly want to do one or two high power runs. We're going to set the low pitch stops. That's another whole discussion. I've already done some videos on that. But we want to make certain for new engines, you keep your ground run CHTs below 300 degrees. We want to be careful not heating those cylinders too hot on the ground or we're going to do some damage to them. We'll never get a good uh, ring seat, right? Okay, for the second run here now, we're going to do a little higher power run and check the ignition system at what would be a normal run up. So typically maybe 1,800 to 2,000 RPMs on Lycomings, maybe 4,000 on the Rotax. So go ahead and start up again, have your fire extinguishers ready. So we are going to go to higher power settings. By the way, make sure nobody's in the prop arc. Okay, and then go ahead and do a normal engine run up. Don't take a long time doing this. Again, we want to keep those cylinder head temps below 300 degrees. So run up, check both ignitions, make certain everything's working properly. Cycle your propeller for those of you who have a constant speed propeller. Now this first time, what's going to happen when you go to cycle that propeller yeah, you're going to want to be up around 2,000 RPMs. You pull that propeller back and you're going to, it's not going to do anything. And you're going to think, I got something wrong. For the first time you cycle a propeller on a new engine or you've removed the propeller or something, it takes a while to fill that whole hub with oil. So pull it back, nothing happens. Keep your hand on it. It'll happen. Okay. Sometimes some of the hard cell governors, you've got to get the RPMs up a little higher, but 2,000, 2,100 usually works. If you're using the MT governors or the PCU 5000X governors, uh, those really work down lower, sometimes around 1200 RPMs, you can get them to cycle. Okay, again, watching our cylinder head temps, once we get through this, we're gonna shut down again, okay? Let's let the engine cool off, and then we're gonna do a third run. The third run, we know everything works. Now, for those of you with a constant speed propeller, 
we're going to check our low pitch blade stops. Now that might take two or three runs. As I said, there's another video on that you can watch to help you do that. But after you've got that all done, the engine should be all good. Of course, if we've had any leaks or anything, you want to get those fixed. Again, the important thing, especially on new engines, keep those cylinder head temps low. Be patient. You might have to sit and wait a little bit between runs. What I've done between runs, if you just take like one of the 20 inch box fans or you got a fan on a stand there in your shop, I'll put that on the engine after I shut down. You'd be surprised how fast it'll cool it down. And then uh, you won't have so much time between runs. Okay, so there you are. That should take care pretty much of making certain the engine's all good. And uh, next video, we'll talk about the airframe.